The end of this video, we'll take a look at Mad Ramp's innovative pivoting ramp system, the safer, easier way to transport your ATVs and snowmobiles. Stick around. Before we begin, I'd like to give a quick shout out to our friends at the historic Lancaster Motel in Lancaster, New Hampshire. The Lancaster Motel has been serving snowmobilers since the 60s and they are the perfect eastern trail riding destination for snowmobilers young and old. The Lancaster Motel is right on Corridor Trail 5 in Lancaster, New Hampshire with plenty of parking for vehicles, sleds and trailers. Plus, the Lancaster Motel is within walking distance of Crane's Snowmobile Museum, plus restaurants, shopping, entertainment and more. Click the link in the description to learn more about the Lancaster Motel. Yeah, I'm on the phone with Midge Rosebrook. How you doing, Midge? Good, Mike. How are you? Doing well, thank you. So, Midge, tell me, what is the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame? The Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame uh, is something Paul Crane and I started here in Lancaster. We uh, felt that there was a need to recognize the guys that used to race here in the East back uh, in what I would call the golden era uh, would be uh, from the mid-1960s to the uh, late 70s, maybe early 80s, but mostly I think the meat of the golden era would be definitely the 1970s. Sure. And uh, it really... Uh, Racing here in the, in the eastern United States never really got covered. Those guys never really got uh, recognized like the Midwest guys did, uh, the factory drivers, you know, and the, and the big name distributors and things like that from the Midwest. They they had this two Hall of Fames out there. Sure. And, uh, you know, they, they recognized their guys. And it's sad that... Uh, the Eastern guys never got recognized, and how this started was, and I can take you back to when we did the 50th reunion of the Lancaster Grand Prix in 2014. Uh -huh. The Grand Prix uh, started in in, uh, in in 1964 uh, as a side event uh, for the Winter Carnival when Lancaster was celebrating their 200 anniversary and uh, it took off uh, and uh, thank you to Timberland Machines uh, the big skidoo distributor here in Lancaster um, it was uh, it was basically Bob Bottoms that 
that uh, allowed uh, his crew to help build the track. Roberts Motors stepped in, uh, Butch and Johnny Roberts. They had a Skidoo dealership there. They helped uh, White Mountain Mac. There were several businesses in town that really stepped to forward and help the snow drifters, the Lancaster snow drifters, uh, actually put the event on. But it uh, took, it was a town effort to put this uh, big race on. And at one time, the Lancaster Grand Prix was the largest outdoor winter event in New Hampshire. Wow. They were, yeah, they, they were pulling in uh, 15,000 fans. 15,000. Wow, that's a big yeah, crowd. They, yeah, uh, they, they counted 15,000 fans for a couple of years there in the early to mid 70s, uh, at the Lancaster Fairgrounds. Wow, that is and, impressive. Uh, with a half mile oval track, uh, horse track. Horse track, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, Polaris was actually the first, um, factory team to come here in 1966. Mm -hmm. Bob Eastman and Randy Heights came and raced uh, in 1966. That was absolutely that was also the first year for the Big Kilkenny Cup, which was donated by Timberland Machines to the Snowdrifters. Oh, no kidding! Yeah, and, yeah. And uh, our own Bill Buckland here from town uh, and Bobby Fortin uh, both got their names on that. Uh, Big cop. They were the first two to to have their names engraved on the cup in '66. Nice. So yeah, and uh, the factory teams came here uh, during the '70s. There would be 10 or 12 fully equipped tractor trailers, 45, 50 foot boxes uh, of uh, the major, you know, distributors and factory teams of the day back then. Mm -hmm. Art of Cat came, Snowjet, Yamaha, Polaris, Skidoo, uh, uh, Mercury, just about every big manufacturer you could think of came here to race at Lancaster. Nice. It was really, it was quite something. And uh, then it, uh, the whole thing ended in New England around 1980. Around 80, okay. Or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. uh, the guys that were putting it on, you know, they were they were getting tired of uh, not getting enough volunteers to help. Uh, the insurance started getting more expensive because people were getting hurt. A couple people got killed, and so the insurance started to increase. Uh, it got costly. Sure. Uh, even though the Grand Prix moved down onto the meadows. Uh, it got away from the telephone poles and the, and the hazards of of what they what occurred at the fairgrounds. Uh, it was a, one of the most safe safest tracks uh, running back then, and everybody touted how great the track was. They they iced it down uh, in 1976. Uh, Gilles Villeneuve came here with that IFS rule. Oh yeah, in cleaned house. Nice. Yeah, this was the first uh, that he made his debut here with that IFS rule at the Lancaster Grand Prix. Oh, no kidding! I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, nice. he made his uh, made his national debut, and in the stands watching that day was Bob Eastman from Polaris. He's the uh, he was the uh, team captain, if you will, Bob sure. Eastman, yeah. and uh, his teammate Wes Pesek was there watching, and this was in 1976, and they were so impressed with that that uh, Bob went back to the factory. They raced at Bangor that next weekend. They went back to the factory, and uh, he called up a guy by the name of Gordon Rudolph, who had been himself dabbling with IFS sleds on his own, and he, he says to Gordon, he said they he hired him to come help them set up a new Polaris racer for the next season. It turned out to be that RXL. Oh, yes, with that suspension. 
that front yeah. suspension. And uh, yeah, of course we know that you know that cleaned house. Sure. And uh, but in 1977, also, it was the last year of the Grand Prix. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, 77 was the last year of the Grand Prix. And uh, they raced in Bangor, you know, for a few years after that, and Scarborough. But basically, by 1980, 81, 82, racing dried up here in New England, and that was about it. Uh, and everybody went back to their day jobs, and and you know, it it was a it was a strange thing. Uh, I I can't think of anything, Mike. In these long pole New England winters, that was ever so as exciting and ever made as big an impact as did snowmobile racing back at its height. I agree. Yeah, I there, agree. There was not, there's nothing. Nothing since has been as exciting or as big or made as big an impact financially for these True. small towns. And there's nothing else I mean, that'll Lancaster, bring people. You know, it, there's nothing yeah. else that'll bring people thousands and thousands of people outside in the middle of winter to be spectators. Or no, something. nothing else is no, going to no. bring that kind of a crowd. No, no, and and to, and to bring uh, you know a, a dozen factory teams from the Midwest. Yeah. You know, to to send a, a team of five or six drivers, fully equipped tractor trailer trucks. Uh, I remember uh, Bob Clark was in the Hall of Fame. Uh, Bob Clark was uh, a multi-Grand Prix chairman uh, during that era. And uh, he said one time, he said he thought it was 1970 or 71, they they held up the races because uh, Team Arctic hadn't showed up yet. Well, they got on to CB. Huh. And they located uh, the, the team Arctic truck. And they said, where the heck are you? Yeah. And the driver says, I'm stuck. <laughs> and they said, stuck? Stuck where? He said, I'm stuck here at the intersection. He said, on your main street. He said, the traffic going to the track won't let me in. <laughs> he said, the traffic is backed up as far as I can see down Lancaster's main street, and then and nobody's letting me in. Wow. So they had to, they, yeah, they had to escort, they sent a cruiser down, a state police cruiser. Yeah. And he escorted Team Arctic's big truck up the left-hand side of the road from that triangle on the, on the end of Main Street there that splits Route 2 and Route 3. Yes. And uh, he escorted him up to the fairgrounds on the left-hand side of the road because the traffic was so heavy going in. That's amazing. That's a great story. It was, it was something. Yeah. Now, while we're talking so, uh, about this, um, I wonder if you could tell me, too, that Lancaster was obviously a massive location and experience for racing. But there were, yeah. how, were they, how were they doing that? Was there a circuit around New England where they would do Bangor one weekend and Boonville another weekend? And how, how were they structuring yeah, that? Yeah. Yeah, that's what they did. Of course, when they came out with the USSA, uh, and uh, they sanctioned, you know, the events. Uh, Lancaster was one of the one of the big boys, and uh, we started. Uh, our our uh, date was pretty much set in stone by the time USSA came out because we'd been racing here since 1962. Wow! And then, of course, they they called it the motorized toboggan races. Huh. In sixty two and sixty three, right. and then uh, they changed it to the Grand Prix to make it sound better, I guess, for the two hundredth birthday of Lancaster that year. That's why they changed the name. Yeah, and uh, <clears throat> so yeah, Lancaster was on this circuit. Uh, Bangor would be, uh, I think, Bangor was a weekend either before or after us, and then they did Scarborough. Mm -hmm. They did Jackman. Jackman, I think, was the, probably one of the first races in the East here. Jackman, Maine. I think yeah. that happened like in December or something like that. And uh, yeah, they had a race in Laconia. They had a race in Boonville, New York. And uh, yeah, the guy. It was like a circuit. It was big time. That's cool. These guys were professionals. 
they were pulling fifteen hundred, two thousand, twenty five hundred dollars a week, like a weekend in. You know, to if uh, like Bobby Fortin uh, yeah. was uh, one of the big name drivers here in the East, and he, where I used to work at the golf station here in Lancaster, he always used to come in, and he'd have a check of a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars to win. Wow. Uh, plus he'd get so much he'd get a you know a couple hundred dollars from a spark plug company or or you know dry belt company. <sighs> yeah, these guys were professionals. That's cool. And uh, it was uh, it was an exciting time. Yeah, it for really sure. was. Sure. And uh, so anyway, uh, when we decided to do a fiftieth reunion of the Grand Prix, a lot of the old guys that used to race back then came to the reunion and I even have a photo of a bunch of them lined you, you've seen it at Paul Crane's yes those guys all lined up on the racetrack yeah and uh, they wanted they, they had they got me in there and I, I kept telling them I said I didn't race I said I should not be in there well they, they begged me to get they, they made me go in so yeah. I mean uh, I shouldn't have been in that photo but I was yeah anyway yeah. That's nice. Though. It, it really it it got me to thinking. You know, it, it's sad that these guys never got recognized. Yeah, for sure. And uh, so I think that I think that planted a seed. Now, can you and, uh, go ahead? Yeah, I'm sorry. And I think it did. And then in 2016, we had the national show here. Yeah. And uh, it packed the fairgrounds. You know, with a bunch of whole uh, beautiful vintage slats it just was an unbelievable show yeah it was i was there and, that was uh, an incredible show wasn't it great it, it was, was a great show and uh so there again his conrad rollins tom peters uh bruce bruce dunham mm -hmm. bob martin all came back and uh you know they they were getting into it again so anyway, I, I said to Paul, I said, uh, the, I tell you who it was, it was a gentleman from, uh, I think it was the Hall of Fame from uh, St. Germain, Wisconsin was there uh, selling a <coughs> raffle sled. He was selling tickets for a raffle sled mm -hmm. for for that Hall of Fame. And, and uh, I had, before that, I had sent Bruce Dunham's, Bob Martin, and uh, Conrad Rollins resumes out there just to see what would happen i i uh wanted to see if maybe i could get one of those guys into the hall of fame out there so yeah. paul approached the guy and he was on the board of directors as well so paul asked him uh, what he thought what his thoughts of uh, bruce dunham uh making it into the hall of fame that year and uh, look, he had a puzzled look on his face and he said hmm, bruce dunham Oh, he said, that doesn't ring a bell. He said, I, I know he's not in the top ten. Wow. And and Paul came to me, and, I, and, and Paul says, they're not, in, he says, they don't even know who Bruce Dunham was. Wow. He said, they're inducting 35 and 40-year-olds out there now. He said, they're, they're, you know, there's, there's no chance. Yeah. He said, we don't, they, we'll never get them in. He said, there's not a chance. So anyway, I went back home. I didn't sleep. Actually, I think I went up to camp up to Maidstone, and I rolled and tossed and turned all night. And all of a sudden, in the middle of the night, I sat up and sh I said right out loud, I said, and my wife wasn't even with me or nobody. I was all alone. Yeah. And I said, that's it. That's it. And I could not wait. This was Saturday. I could not wait for Sunday morning to get a hold of Paul Crane. And, and and ask him, you know, if I, I so anyway, about seven o'clock uh, Sunday morning, uh, I didn't want to get him too early, so I waited until seven. <laughs> so I grabbed the phone, I dialed Paul's number. Paul answered, and I says, "Paul, you sitting down?" And he says, "No." He said, "I I could." <laughs> I said, "What What are your thoughts on having our own Hall of Fame?" I said, "We could do it at your museum." Paul says, let's do it. Nice. Just like that. Wow. And that's how it started. And the ball has just continued and, to roll yeah. from there. 
and it's, it continued to roll from there. We inducted our first uh, inaugural four people uh, into the Hall of Fame uh, in 2017. Uh, it was May 19th, I think, of 2017. Uh, we inducted our first four, and uh, and then the next year we inducted five, and then the next year we inducted five more, and in this last year we inducted seven. Nice. Now, can you tell me about some of these people who have been inducted and also what qualifies someone to be inducted into the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame? You know what? Uh, you, you, you don't have to have a perfect record. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, uh, you know, when, when you say the Hall of Fame, the word fame means famous. Okay? That, that's, that's just a short for famous. Mm -hmm. It's a Hall of the Famous, really. Sure. And uh, Tom Peters, let's for an example, we just inducted Tom Peters this year. He's from northern Maine, way up near the border of Canada. But Tom Peters was a hero to those guys up there. And uh, he never raced in any place but Maine. Hmm. Never went outside of the Maine borders. Yeah. And to those, to those people in those small little towns in northern Maine, there was no bigger name than Tom Peters. Wow. And uh, he was actually inducted into the Maine Motorsports Hall of Fame. Uh, the only snowmobile racer to, to be inducted into the Motorsports Hall of Fame. That's an honor, yeah. Yeah, it is. That's a high uh, honor. But, but, you, but I think they did that because he only raced in Maine. Yeah. So... Did he have as big a record as Bruce Dunham? No. Did he have as big a record as Cal Reynolds or Bob Fortin? Right. No. But to those people in northern Maine, Tom Peters was the biggest name in sports right there. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And that's the reason why Tom Peters is in the Hall of Fame. Nice. And I can pick out a few other people that may not have had perfect records, but they were, they were big names here in the East. So uh, we try to give, uh, we try not, you know, not everybody can make it into the Hall of Fame. I realize that. Everybody yeah. should realize that. Sure. But if, you know, if you did something special, if, you, if your name was, was one of the big names in the East, even though you might not have had a, a huge record, mm -hmm. you got a good shot. Yeah, good shot of being recognized. And, uh, yeah. Nice. Uh yeah, we've got Bruce Dunham in there, Bob Martin is in there, uh, Conrad Rollins, those are the first guys that we inducted. Mm -hmm. uh, Calvin Reynolds from Maine is in there. Uh, there's quite a few Mainers. Uh, we've got, of course, Tom Peters, I just mentioned Tom. Sure, Paul uh, Lamontang. We've got Paul Lamontang. Yeah. Paul was a big, he was big. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Paul was a rough racer and... Uh, and then later he raced Chaparral, and then he raced uh, Mercury. Uh, Paul, the, the name Paul Lamontang was huge here in New England. Yeah. Uh, we've got uh, uh, well Joe Wilkinson from Massachusetts. We just inducted Joe. Uh, Louis Lunn, we inducted Louis in uh, 2018, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Louis uh, only raced uh, maybe three, four years. Uh, I think he got number nine bib one year, mm -hmm. so he's top ten. Yeah. Well, what made Louis special? <clears throat> he may not have had as big a record, maybe as Bob Fortin, but what made Louis special was he was the first person to drive an IFS sled. Oh, no kidding, yeah. Yeah, because he was racing for Harrington King in Randolph, Mass. In 1972, they were the Chaparral distributor. They flew Louis out to Colorado. Uh, Chaparral had a, a, a secret uh, 
race sled that they were working on out there. Yeah. And guess who he was working with? Huh. Bobby Unser. Oh, no kidding. Bobby Unser designed the first IFS suspension on a snowmobile, and Louis was uh, was the uh, test driver for Bobby Unser. No kidding. So yeah, that that's no Louis small. Won. He was the very first person to drive an IFS sled. And what sled today doesn't have an IFS suspension? Yeah, that's standard today. Yeah. So that 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 in itself. That's huge. Is a, is a, is a reason why Louis Louis Lund needs to be in the Hall of Fame. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and so uh, that's that's how we pick and choose uh, the folks that need to be there. Yeah. yeah. Very nice. Now, what, uh, what, or I should say, when and where is the next induction ceremony going to be? Uh, the next induction ceremony is going to be September 11th, mm -hmm. which in itself is, uh, uh, you know, not a very nice date to maybe have it, but uh, it's the it's the weekend after the fair. Okay. And uh, we'll I'll probably say something, you know, about September 11th. And, yeah, to kind of honor that uh, solemn, and, you know, solemn moment. A little something there. Right. Yeah. Uh, but uh, it seems to be the best date for us because uh, we're inducting a, a person from New York who uh, is, is heavily into stock car racing and his grandson uh, races stock cars and he's on the pit crew. Yeah. And so... That happens to be the only open weekend for them. Gotcha. So, in order to have him be able to attend the induction, uh, that's that's the weekend we had to pick. Sure, sure. Yeah. And this is this is going to be at Crane's Museum in Lancaster. Yes, this will be at Crane's Museum, and uh, it'll, we'll do another outside ceremony. That seemed to work really good. That was very nice. Hopefully, it doesn't rain. Yeah. <laughs> you know, <laughs> uh, if it does, we'll try to do it Sunday probably yeah uh, as a rain day but uh, hopefully uh, usually the by that time in the fall we have really really nice weather yeah and I'd like to add too and, that uh, if anyone is planning to attend this from out of town there's no other place to stay Lancaster Motel the Lancaster yeah. Motel absolutely there are good absolutely. friends over there absolutely the, they, they, they've stepped to the plate they, they are so all over this thing uh, the Lancaster Motel grew up with snowmobile racing. Uh, I believe that was built in 1956. Mm -hmm. It was built by Norman McLaughlin. Yeah. Uh, his daughter Sally married Mike Beatty, who is in the Hall of Fame at Riverside Speedway as a stock car racer. He was a well-known stock car racer here in New England back during the 60s and early 70s. Yeah. And Mike Beatty was a multi-Grand Prix chairman. Uh, so th there's a big, big history of the Lancaster Grand Prix tied to the snowmobile circuit racing. Yeah. And, and didn't they, they used uh, to have the awards ceremony up. at the Lancaster Motel? That's where, they, that's where they had the awards ceremonies during the original Grand Prix. Yeah. And I think that's a lot of the racers stayed there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, can you just imagine, Mike, bellying up to the bar with Bob Eastman or <laughs> Larry Coltham? That would be amazing. Uh, you know, or one of the Trap Brothers, or, I mean, they they were all here. That's where they stayed. That would be amazing. This place is huge. Yeah. Uh, not, not in size, but in history. Yeah, the history is rich. Yeah, very rich with the Lancaster Motel, so... I think we probably will have to make that our official uh, site. I agree. Uh, for, the, for the Hall of Fame, the Lancaster Motel is the official place to stay. Yeah, for sure. There's no other. And uh, yeah, I, and they fixed the rooms all up. The people that just purchased the motel uh, have done a tremendous job on the place. They've gone through every room. Uh, they put in all new Wi-Fi, new TVs, uh, refurbished every room. New so flooring, uh, everything. They, yeah. they brought it back up to to snuff, and uh, it's going to be uh, it's it's a great uh, asset 
Yeah, to and it's just into this hall of fame. and it's just walking distance from the the ceremony. Yeah, it's just yeah, it's only a block away. Yeah, from Crane's museum and the ceremony. And, yeah, yeah. Now let me ask yeah. you this: um, each year that I attend this induction ceremony, the crowd gets bigger and bigger. So this is something that's growing, and the future is looking bright. What are you thinking? Yeah. Are plans for the future for the Eastern Snowmobile Racing Hall of Fame? What are you thinking about the future of this? Well, we're going to try to continue uh, adding more of the uh, original racing pioneers uh, that raced, you know, back in the day. Yeah. Uh, they're getting older all the time. They're they're in their late seventies, mid late seventies, early eighties, and we'd like to get them, you know, here while they're still with us. Yes, the clock is ticking. That, that being said. Uh, when I uh, did Cal Reynolds uh, in 2018, we put uh, Cal on the wall, and he was huge back then. He was a skidoo racer, mm-hmm. and uh, he won about everything going. Yeah. And anyway, after the ceremony, uh, instead of going up for photos, instead of thinking about himself, Mike, I felt an arm across my shoulder, and it was Cal Reynolds whispering in my ear. Huh. He said, Midge, he said, Bob Fortin really needs to be up there. And I says, I, I know, Mike. I, uh, I says, I, I know, Cal. Uh, you know what, though? What we're thinking about doing is getting all the people up there that are with us first, and then we'll try to do the ones that have passed away uh, at a later date. And he shook his head and he said, Midge, he said, that Bob Eastman, that Bob Fort needs to be up there more sooner than later. Yeah. And uh, so I told Paul I, I, what, what Cal said. And um, Paul said, yeah, he said, what we probably should do is, is uh, induct four people that are with us and maybe one who's passed away each year yeah because you know what their families aren't getting any younger either that's true isn't it yeah you know good point so in 20 in 2019 we had bob fortin's two sons michael and david uh attend and uh i asked cal i i emailed cal and i said calvin uh, would you please say a few good words about Bob Fortin because you raced against him. He, you know, he raced for Timberland Machines and uh, he knew Bob very well. He said, certainly. He said, I'd, I'd love to do that. So I introduced Cal when we did Bob and his two sons stood up there. It was quite moving. I remember and, uh, that. It was very touching. Yeah. So, yeah, Calvin did that for us, and we uh, we thanked him. And I, I know he's a busy man. You know, Cal's got several businesses over in Maine there that he that he has to attend. And so uh, I I said to him, I said, uh, well, when he said, uh, uh, yeah, I said I would do. Bob Fortin for you guys and, and, and say a few good words about him. Yeah. And I said, uh, well, I'm, I'm just pleased that you could do this just, just one more time for us, Cal. I know you're busy. He said, Mid, let me tell you something. He said, as long as me and my wife, Mary Ann, are able, we will be attending every single Hall of Fame induction that you're going to hold here from now on. Nice. And he's true to his word. I've so seen him at every one. He, yeah. And he spoke this year at uh, Ted Wynott. Ted Wynott, of course, was uh, the flagman for those guys for yes. years and years. He was also a Yamaha representative, and Cal sold Yamaha over there in Maine. So, yeah. you know, Ted was over there a lot, and uh, he was a good, good friend of Cal's. And, uh, so Cal spoke a, a few nice words about Teddy. This that year was nice, too, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, very nice. 
So any final words, Mitch, uh, before we close this interview? Do you have any final thoughts you'd like to add yeah, about the uh, Hall of Fame? Well, uh, I just want to tell you folks uh, how much we appreciate Mike LaPierre here that's interviewing me. Uh, Mike has gone overboard for us, and I just have to put that in. I appreciate that. Uh, we really, we really appreciate everything you do, Mike. Well, you're very and, welcome. Uh, as far as this Hall of Fame, we hope to continue this down the road, and we hope to get uh, as many of our original pioneer racers who who, who were big names back then on the wall at Paul Crane's Museum. And uh, that's that's basically where we're at. And uh, these inductions are free. Uh, anybody can attend. Uh, bring a lawn chair and, and join us. If, uh, if you are my age, I'm going to be 70 in March. If, if anybody out there remembers those events, the way I did and stood out in the cold for three hours or four hours watching those guys race if you can remember the exciting time that, that was then this is for you yeah because reliving you the get golden to hear age these guys on you get to shake their hand you get to you get to talk to them and you get to see these guys be recognized that uh, that you know it was just an event that will never come back again. We'll never ever see anything that exciting again. And uh, if you want to relive those moments just one more time, please join us. And the next event is September 11th, 2021, at Paul Crane Snowmobile Museum in Lancaster. Yeah. And I'd like to add to that to what you just said. Right now is the golden age of, of celebrating the golden age of snowmobiling. Exactly. It exactly. truly is. And, uh, yeah, I'd like yeah. to invite everyone who's within driving distance to, to come on come on by and, yeah. and uh, enjoy it with us. It grows. Stay it gets bigger every year. It's a, it's a wonderful thing. Yeah, stay at the Lancaster Motel. Yeah. Yeah. And and then come by to the after party at the Lancaster Motel as well. That's it's a yeah, wonderful yeah. time. Yeah, they have an after party at the motel. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, back years ago during the Grand Prix, I told these guys, I said, you race uh, handlebar to handlebar all day long and stand elbow to elbow at the bars all night. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> it was. They used, to, they used to pull the engines off because, <clears throat> you know, these, these, guys, <laughs> these guys were crazy. They used to pull the engines off their sleds and take them inside the motel room and rebuild them <laughs> for the next day's race. Nice. And that's yeah, one of the, that's yeah. one of the remarkable things too about racing is they can be so um, ruthlessly competitive out on the track, but after the race is yeah. over, they party together and they have a good time and they laugh about it. Yeah, it's it's an, it's incredibly yeah. ironic, but it's 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 a wonderful thing about racing is that that the relationships yeah. Yeah, are more really. important than than anything. It's it's a wonderful yeah, thing. Know, they they made lifelong friends, Mike. Yeah. You know these these guys. Uh, when you, you when you, their eyes light up the minute they see an old competitor, yeah, uh, you know that they haven't seen for forty years, you know. Yeah, and to watch them uh, reminisce, it's a truly special thing. They, yeah, they sit they're in, they're in heaven when they're doing it. They love it. Go it's, ahead. I'm it's sorry. It's more like a family reunion. It is. Yeah. And to hear all those old stories, and because they can recall like a specific moment on some turn in the track during a race where things were happening and. And, and kind of relive yeah. that, and it's it's incredible. Yeah, yeah, or, or uh, laugh because you know about uh, an incident that uh, some guy pushed them off the track yeah. when they were in the lead, you know, and, uh, and you know they'd say, "You pushed me off the track, you pushed me over the bank, or something like that," and yeah. then they laugh about it. They yeah. probably weren't laughing at the time, but no, yeah, yeah. You know, this is only gonna this is only gonna be a small window here too. It's true. The clock because is ticking for all of us. Are, like I just said, they're 75, 80 years old, 85 years old, and they're not going to be around forever. Yeah. Yeah, the clock is ticking so on all of this. We've got a small window here to enjoy these guys. Yeah, to really do something to, with this. to uh, appreciate these guys. Yeah. 
and women. Yes. Yeah, there were some uh, truly remarkable so, women in this, this racing as well. Oh, yeah. Yep. Judy Rinaldi. Yes. Ten World Series. That's incredible. She won ten World Series. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Uh, not not no man no man has ever done that before. So, uh, you know, she's uh, I mean, there's there's nobody <laughs> nobody close. No. Uh, unbelievable. And, and uh, the nice thing about her too is to think about someone so accomplished, but to 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 visit with her, she's just the easiest person to talk to and the most relatable, personable person. Uh, very oh, yeah. down to earth, just a classy, classy lady. It's, uh, and, oh, yeah. and I could say the same of the rest of them as well. You know, for all of yeah. their accomplishments, they're, they're very down to earth. Yeah, those are the nicest people. It's true. Yeah, they're no really egos, just guess. very approachable. Nice yeah. yeah, it's wonderful. Yeah. They all are. It's true. Yeah, no, uh, Paula Montang. I mean, uh, who who wouldn't want to party with Paula Montang? <laughs> yes. He is the best he guy to hang out with. He's a lucky guy. Yeah, he's a lot of fun to visit with. He, he's a lot of fun. He really is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, good, good. Well, I appreciate your time with us, uh, uh, Mitch. And, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll close it out. But uh, I really appreciate your time. And, and we'll have more interviews on this topic, I'm sure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. All righty. I've got more tales to tell. Well, good. We'll look forward to it. <laughs> okay. All right. Thanks for my, thanks for this, Mike. You're very welcome. It's the ultimate combination of simplicity and ingenuity. The newest way to load, unload, and transport your ATV or UTV. The Mad Ramps Pivoting Ramp System. Made in the USA and engineered for strength and durability. Maneuver through tight places and over rugged terrain with plenty of ground clearance. No licensing, no ongoing maintenance costs, and no storage hassles like trailers. Won't slip or move like conventional ramps. Free up more cargo space in the bed of your truck. Securely connects to your truck's receiver hitch easily extends for safe loading and unloading, seamlessly retracts for highway and off-road travel, DOT approved in all 50 states and Canada, quickly disconnects in under a minute, a unique space-saving storage system, the Mad Ramps Pivoting Ramp System. Go farther, go faster, go safer. When you order using the link in the description, I'll send you three free vintage snowmobile DVDs. Using the link in the description, I'll send you three free vintage snowmobile DVDs.